Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Liz, Adult Services Manager at the Chillicothe and Ross County Public Library. And I'm here with uh, Lakeisha Darden this, this afternoon. Uh, Lakeisha is the Curriculum Materials and Media Librarian for Wiggins Memorial Library at Campbell University. And today she's going to be talking about diversity in literature. Go ahead, Lakeisha. OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. As Liz says, I am um, Dr. Lakeisha Darden, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and, right now I'm still serving my last term as the Credit Scott King Book Awards Jury Chair. And as Liz said, I am the CMC Librarian for Wiggins Memorial Library at Campbell University, and that's located in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. I'm a former high school English teacher. I taught English for about eight years. And I'm currently, as long as my role with CMC Librarian, I'm also an adjunct professor for the School of Education at Campbell. And I've taught integrated reading, teaching reading in the middle and secondary grades, and children's literature. And I recently completed my dissertation last semester, and the title of that was Diversity Training Through Story, University Professionals Explore Narratives of the Black Experience by Reading Coretta Scott King Book Award Titles. So you know a little bit more about me professionally. So exploring the Black experience through the lens of Black children's literature. So this lecture today will be organized by the following topics. The Brownies book for Children of the Sun. Topic two would be Mirrors and, Weir Mirrors and Windows and the Credit Scott King Book Awards. And our last topic will be Black children's literature today. And I did want to define a few terms because I'll be using them, throwing them around so that you can understand what do I mean when I say Black experience. Um, encompasses the daily movements, encounters, speech, and way of life of a person of African descent who has dark skin is perceived as Black by white society, thus is subject to various forms of oppression due to systemic racism. Culture, it will be defined a total way of life held in common by a group of people who share similarities in speech, behavior, ideology, livelihood, technology, values, and social customs. Cultural awareness, one's understanding of the differences between themselves and people from other countries or other backgrounds, especially differences in attitudes and values. And white privilege, the ability to navigate through one's life without experiencing the same forms of oppression that black additional people of color experience because of dark skin and systemic racism. So the Brownies book for Children of the Sun. Perhaps they are the most well-known, earliest, substantial contributor to the landscape of African-American children's literature. Uh, the Brownies book was uh, the brainchild of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, and he intended this publication specifically for Children of the Sun, Black children. The magazine existed from January 1920 to December 1921, and featured biographies, poetry, songs, stories, opinion columns, and children's accomplishments in a section titled Little People of the Month. The Brownies book primary audience was Black children, and Du Bois's purpose behind the publication was to support the education of Black children and continue to uplift the race through the cultivation and development of gifted Black youth. Okay, so his main goals for Brownie's book. One, to make colored children realize that being color is a normal, beautiful thing. Two, to make them familiar with the history and achievements of the Negro race. Three, to make them know that other colored children have grown into beautiful, useful, and famous persons. Four, to teach them delicately a code of honor and action in their relations with white children. Five, to turn their little hurts and resentments into emulation, ambition, and love of their homes and companions. Six, to point out the best amusements and joys and worthwhile things of life. And seven, to inspire them to prepare for definite occupations and duties with a broad spirit of sacrifice. Okay. And so here's um, one issue of the Brownies book. And the title of this short story is As the Crow Flies. And I've retyped for you here the two first paragraphs of the story. The crow is black and oh so beautiful, shining with dark blues and purples with little hints of gold in his mighty wings. He flies far above the earth, looking downward with his sharp eyes. 
with a lot of things he must see and hear. And if he could only talk and lo, the Brownies book has made him talk for you. So you're thinking about this delightful, you know, the children's story and points back to Du Bois's goal number six to point out the best amusements and joys and worthwhile things in life for black children. So the little people of the month, uh, this was the section included in every issue of the Brownies book celebrating achievements of young children. Okay. And I pulled out two, uh, four-year-old Ida Josephine Clark sings and she has recited to an audience of over 100 people Aren't you too proud of little Ida? She lives in Elyria, Ohio. Think of being a violinist at the age of seven? Well, Charles J. Donald Jr. of Atlanta, Georgia is, and he has played for two recitals at Morehouse College. And you think back to goal three, to make them know that other colored children have grown into beautiful, useful, and famous persons. I mean, this was a big deal to celebrate the achievements of young people in the 1920s. So Langston Hughes, Central High Cleveland, he actually wrote Dr. Du Bois to be included in the publication. He had seen previous publications and how they uh, celebrated the achievements. And, this, and they published this just as it is written in the issue. It might interest you to know that I have been elected class poet and have also written the class song for the graduates. I am too editor of the annual and am the first Negro to hold the position since 1901 when it was held by the son of Charles W. Chestnut. I thank you for the honor of having my picture in your publication. Okay. So the Brownies book was the first magazine to publish the poetry of Langston Hughes, who would later become one of the most celebrated writers of the Harlem Renaissance. Makes you wonder, would there have been a Langston without the Brownies book? So the Brownies book for Children of the Sun, you know, Dr. Du Bois was very adamant about making sure that these books celebrated black life and the achievements, making sure that you built the self-esteem of colored children so that they realized that being colored was the normal, beautiful thing. Why is it so important to him? Because you have to think about during the 1920s and 1930s, children's books that feature blacks were mostly written by white authors with little knowledge about black life but they wrote as if they were the authority. And it became an accepted fact by whites in children's books that blacks were lazy, shiftless, lived in shanties, had nothing and wanted nothing, sang and laughed all day. These narratives were also called plantation stories. Elsie Purnell wrote Diddy Dumps and Tot or Plantation Child Life. Inez Hogan wrote the Nicodemus books. And Annie Vaughn wrote Frog about a character who just sang and ate watermelon. The dialect was as offensive as the illustrations. These books were an insult to black children and books like these were read by white children who were meeting blacks in them and forming inaccurate ideas and opinions. So as we move along to Mirror and Windows and the CSK Awards, Mirror's Windows and Sliding Glass Doors. Books are sometimes windows offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become a part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. Reading then becomes a means of self-affirmation and readers often seek their mirrors in books. From reading, for example, children may be, can become aware of some of the many variations of the way English is spoken in this country and the richness those variations add to the language. Books can also introduce readers to the history and traditions that are important to any one cultural group and which invite comparisons to their own. And all of these quotes were from Dr. Rudine Seals Bishop, the most celebrated children, black children's literature a scholar. And those are three points we want to think about. The life experiences reflected spark the harmer, the larger human experience for Black youth, the many variations of the way English is spoken. So being able to see Black language and our experiences reflected in literature, the importance of that. And then again, the history and traditions that is important to Black culture. So when you pair that with the Credit Scott King Book Awards criteria, the award is given to an African-American author 
and an African-American illustrator for outstanding contributions that demonstrate an appreciation of African-American culture and universal human values. So this is a, a strong reaction to having non-Black people tell our stories. So the focus on the war is showing the appreciation of the culture, the values, and it must be written by an African-American author. The text that wins must be illustrated by an African-American author. The award is further des designed to commemorate the life and works of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to honor Ms. Coretta Scott King for her courage and determination to continue the work for peace and world brotherhood after her husband's death. Okay, so if you look at all three, Dr. DuBose's goals for the Brownie books, Dr. Rudine Bishop's identifiers for quality Black children's literature, and then you compare those to the criteria for the CSK Book Award, you see very similar themes here. So let's go through briefly a brief history of the CSK winners. You'll be able to notice some of those points that we saw between the, the Brownies books, the goals of um, what Du Bois was trying to achieve with Black children's literature, the CSK criteria, and then what Dr. Bishop suggested as identifiers for quality Black literature. And if we're just looking at the titles, I've highlighted um, most of the titles in purple, some are still in white. But the very first CSK winner was Martin Luther King Jr., Man of Peace by Lily Patterson. Okay, so again, that's going a nod to historical achievements of the he Negro race. Black Troubadour, and then another book about Langston Hughes. The next winner, 17 Black Artists. Then in 1973, I Never Had It Made, the autobiography of Jackie Robinson. So you can see a theme here of celebrating achievements of the Negro race. In between, there are a few stories. When we start going to the 80s, we still have some historical texts, but we have popping through historical fiction. Mildred D. Taylor's uh, her second in the saga, The Logan Family, Let the Circle Be Unbroken. The first book in that uh, series is Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which was a CSK honor book, but it did win the New Newberry honor and a few more um, historical fictions. We have Virginia Hamilton celebrated a uh, children's author, The People Could Fly, so folk tales, another way to learn about your race, culture, values. And then we have Walter D. Myers, who a lot of um, contemporary YA authors today can, note, can put, look back and remember reading their first YA from Walter D. Myers it's black, in Black children's literature. So then we get to the 90s. Again, if you're just looking at the title, still see a lot of history, achievements. We got uh, Mildred D. Taylor's third novel, The Logan Family, The Road to Memphis, historical fiction. Her stories is another collection of folk tales from Virginia Hamilton. And then Walter D. Myers, again, with some more um, YA Swift Slam. Sharon Draper, Forged by Fire, more YA, Angela Johnson. So you can see the closer we get to more contemporary, we have more um, stories of the Black experience written for youth, but not Buddy, Christopher Paul Curtis, Jacqueline Woodson, Miracles Boys, Mildred D. Taylor again with the next issue for the Logan family, The Land. We have some new art, Nikki Grimes, The Brock's Masquerades, again, more, more tales that are not just historically fixed history focus. Now we're getting more into the literature aspect of Black literature, of Black children's literature. Copper Sun, Sharon Japer, Crystal Fall Curtis, Elijah Buxton. You, you know these same authors are getting, were awarded the medals. Okay. And then Kadir Nelson, We Are the Ship, The Story of the Negro Baseball League. So more again, achievements of the Negro race. So more recent, 2010, Bad News for Outlaws with Marco Life of Bass Reeves, Deputy U.S. Marshal, again, more achievements of the Negro race, some historical fiction, One Crazy Summer, 
Rita Williams, and this was a trilogy, okay? A little series. Kadir Nelson, another uh, winner, again, Heart and Soul. This is another one that's focusing on the achievements and history of the Negro race. Uh, Andrea Davis Pinckney, Hand in Hand, 10 Black Men Who Changed America. Another one focusing on the history and achievements. PSB 11, more YA literature. Brown Girl Dreaming, YA literature from Jacqueline Woodson. Congressman John Lewis and Andrew Aiden, book three for March, won the award in 2017. And that is also a graphic novel. Um, Renee Watson's Piece of Me Together, more YA literature. Claire Hartfield, this is a nonfiction text, A Few Red Drops, The Chicago Race Riot of 1919. And Jerry Craft, author of New Kid in 2020 and in 2021, Jacqueline Woodson again, more YA before the ever after. New Kid is also a graphic novel. And before the ever after was, it's written in verse and it focuses on um, the effects of CTE with a black family. Um, Early on when uh, the league, the football league, wasn't sure exactly about what CT was in the general public. So it's set in the 1990s. So we're getting more literature, more uh, reflections of the black experience from the point of, from the point of view of our youth. Okay. So CSK criteria must portray some aspect of the black experience, past, present, or future. Very different from what we have from the Brownies book and Dr. Bishop's identifiers must be written by African American, must be original work, must be written for youth and grace, pre K through 12. Audience here is very important. Um, some of the past, um, the Brownies book, if you read some of the issues, some of the short stories, and some of the earlier CSK winners, it is kind of difficult to kind of picture who is this written for youth or adults, but this more clearly, they, these should be written for youth. And particular attention would be paid to titles which seek to motivate readers to develop their own attitudes and behaviors, as well as comprehend their personal duty. I hope you guys can hear me. And responsibility as citizens in a pluralistic society. Very tall order. Okay. So if we look at Black children's literature today, so it's not just focusing on the achievements of the Negro race and the struggle and how far we've come, but it's also just telling those universal human values through the lens and perspectives of young adults. And we have a few here, it's not exhaustive list, but with Monday's Not Coming, um, a novel by Tiffany D. Jackson, who, who actually won the John Steptoe Award, CSK for New Talent this year that she was awarded. And it's about um, what happens when Black children fall through the cracks. You know, what happens when you're coming from a broken family and no one's paying attention and how the effects of that village that we've lost, how that affects our, the children. And, and it's a nod to missing Black girls across the United States and how it seems that that is not as important when there are missing white girls. Okay. So very kind of a rip from the headlines title. Same with Long Way Down, dealing with grief and wanting to get revenge. And as he goes, he takes the elevator in his apartment building down to the first floor. And as he gets to each floor, he meets a different apparition who represents um, different people in his life. And he's trying to make that decision before he gets to the first floor if he's going to avenge his brother's death. Okay, it's a very um, poignant tale and a very universal theme of wanting to get revenge and how do we deal with grief. New Kid, the graphic novel that I mentioned earlier, um, it's going to a private school, mostly predominantly white private school. There are other students of color there, but they all have to deal with microaggression. Like what does this look like um, for teens, uh, for young people? We see this in a larger scale when you're thinking about systemic racism and um, unfair practices in the workplace. But how does this look like for youth? And this book captures that very well. Uh, the Undefeated. Now, this also has a nod to the past. You know, it talks about the, what well, doesn't talk, it shows, it illustrates the middle passage and how the cargo, the slave cargo ships look like and 
Um, Kadir Nelson does a very beautiful job with just calling it the unspeakable. There are no other words to describe such such a horror. But then throughout the text, you have um, you're celebrating other figures of Black history, and also included um, Kwame Alexander Kadir Nelson have also included the Black Lives Matter protests. And so a very comprehensive picture book. Genesis Begins Again is another YA title that focuses on the effects of colorism. And so you're these human universal human values of trying to make friends and moving to a new school. But then what makes this um, unique to the Black experience is dealing with colorism and how you're treated when you're darker or lighter within the Black community. Peace and Me Together features another a young black girl who has to go to a, just as new kid, uh, she has to go to a private, predominantly private white school. Um, her mother sends her there because she feels like she'll get, she'll be more successful and she won't um, turn out like others in their neighborhood if she can get her away, get her a better education. And so she's trying to always um, deal with the, the double consciousness or switch code switching and trying to fit in or not fit in and trying to bring her authentic self. So these stories and what they mean for young adults, like the black experience for young adults is the same when you're thinking about the universal home, human themes, falling in love, growing up, um, trying to figure out what you want to do, college, do I want to work? You know, all this, the same issues that all teens experience, but there's a different layer when you're going through these experiences as a Black teen. So what is all this reading for? Um, you're hoping, the hope is that through narrative theory, which the Ohio State University's project narrative defines narrative theory as a belief that a basic human strategy for coming to terms with fundamental elements of our experience is via the study of and through the interaction with narratives, such as lyric poems, arguments, lists, descriptions, and so on, investigating how accounts of what happened to particular people in particular circumstances with particular consequences can be both common and so powerful that the effect results to a change in one's thinking. So that's the goal, right? You, you read a text and maybe you thought one way about a certain group of people or a certain experience, but then after reading that text, hopefully you have a new way of thinking. To, so to put it in visual form, so you have your identity, your pre-belief system before you read a text. So you already have what do you believe about yourself, your culture, and what you believe about the select group um, and their culture before you read that text. And as you're reading it, you're in the phase of discovery, you're being exposed to very experiences of the select group and what have you learned about from the narrative about the select experience, in this case, the black experience, and how do you connect to the select experience and has your attitude about the experience or the select group change? And if it does not change, then you rejected the counter narrative and your, and your pre-belief system of the select group and culture has remained the same. But if, it, if you do accept the counter narrative, then there's a change in your thinking and now you're in this awareness mode, your post-belief system. And so now you have to reconcile, what do I now believe about the select group and their culture? And how do I now view myself and my culture in comparison to the select group? So that's what ultimate goal you're hoping that once someone reads one of these texts that there's that narrative theory occurs, that there is a change in one's thinking. So we have now reached a point where most aspects of the human experience in the Black community can be portrayed in children's books without being self-conscious. Augusta Baker from the introductory paragraph of her book, The Black Experience in Books for Children. A lot of this was interesting because when you think back on the Brownies book from W.B. Du Bois, he was very particular, very purposeful about making sure he changed the narrative of Black people. We're not lazy. We work hard. Uh, look at all our achievements. It's a beautiful thing to be Black. And, you know, it begs the question, were these stories really for Black children or were they really for the white audience? Like, who was he thinking going to read these books? And so now, so it's interesting for her to say in 1971 that she felt like uh, Black authors were writing books without being self-conscious or being free from thinking about the white gaze, as Toni Morrison has called it, 
Um, but I think we're just now coming to that phase now. If you, we have more books, uh, black, children, black children's literature books, black YA authors who are just writing about living life and how these children go through um, different universal values, but how it affects them as being black. So maybe we're coming to that space now where we're not as self-conscious anymore about our lives. And among the recent rush to become more anti-racist and more culturally aware of the black experience, there is limited research on what methods work best and the lasting effects of narrative theory. Cultural competence is not a race, not even a marathon, but a life journey. Proceed with caution as those thinking that simply reading a book or two is the single solution that will heal society's racial ills. Reading and opening oneself up to learning is only the beginning. Non-Black readers of Black children's literature need to be open to identifying and accepting the full humanity of Black people. So we may have questions or maybe you have a comment. Um, Liz, should I stop sharing or? Sorry, I realized I was muted. Um, <laughs> I'm only asking because I can't see the I can't see the comment box or anything. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to go ahead, if people want to scroll back and get your contact information, they can do that. Um, so I'm just going to do this, and you can stop sharing and okay back to just us. Um, we did have one question come through on the comments. Um, when do women become more celebrated as historical topics? Oh. I think that one came th came up when you were going through the timeline of the um, the award winners. Okay. Um, I think there have been a celebrated, um, if you're looking at award winners, because I only focus on the CSK award author winner, but we do, if you keep in mind, there were several author honors and I just didn't address that because of time. And, <laughs> but, um, so I guess it is a little misleading because we have several titles that were written, um, like we have the most recent this year was celebrating Aretha Franklin. In the past, we've had Josephine Baker. Um, there have been books about, I'm on the spot, I'm trying to think of just CSK, uh, Coretta Scott King. We've also had so quite a few. Billie Holiday, that was an honor. Um, so there's, a, there's several of them that are there. They just weren't the medal winner that year. They probably received the author honor. Um, another question that came through was, can you speak about your experience with the Credit Scott King Award? Okay, so just in, just in general. Oh, and she said thank you for that other answer. Okay. <laughs> but yes, in general, your okay. experience. Um, this has been my fourth year on the committee. The first two years, I was just a juror, and then the last two years, I served as the chair. Um, the Coretta Scott King Committee is a little different from the other ALA committees, Newberry and Caldecott, because we have a full committee. We do other things besides award medals. And so that confuses people because when some people say, I'm on the Coretta Scott King Committee, they're like, oh, so what book? So there's the committee, and then there's the jury. And so, so we're a little different from the other ones. And um, it's been, I've loved, I've loved serving on the, the committee. I remember reading CSK books growing up. My first CSK book was Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. Um, so it was kind of surreal for me it's first to just be a juror and serve and read all these great titles and then decide who gets the medal. And then to be a, a jury, the chair, I was just ecstatic. So just thinking back to the little girl who used to read all of these titles and look at these Look at that triangle on all of these great books and knowing that I'm about to read so, about someone who looks like me, who talks like me, who experienced, who's had experiences like me, and now to be able to serve in this capacity has just been uh, wonderful. So what other kinds of things does the committee do besides the book awards, just for people who are more familiar with the other ALA book award committees? Yeah, so the Crest Scott King Committee, we have, we award a book grant every year. And so that book grant, basically all the books that the jury receive to try to figure out who wins. If you if your organization wins that book grant, you get all those books. So for example, this year we had over 200 plus books 
sent to us to consider for the 2021 award. And so if whichever organization wins the book grant that year, they'll get all of those books. And so we do that. Um, we also have an a, a archives committee. So we're always uh, saving things, documenting things. Like people have asked me, like, this, did Credit Scott King really have something to do with the committee? And she did. You know, she was at the 1980. Uh, the 1980 breakfast in New Orleans. She actually spoke at that one. And so just collecting all of these stories, that's what our publication committee does to make sure that all of this stuff is archived and stored and kept so that people can go back and access these records. And we also have the John Steptoe Award for New Talent for author and illustrator. And um, the whole purpose why that award came to be was the CSK Awards came to be because people were frustrated that our authors weren't winning the Newberry, they weren't being celebrated. And so kind of like, well, let's just start our own <laughs> award. And they did. And so to, and you start noticing that once people get medals in their books, their books start to sell. And so what else can we do to promote black um, writers and illustrators? And so they came up with the John Step to Award for debut authors and illustrators, no more than three books published to kind of push them into the limelight and get their careers going as well. So we have the CSK Author Award, Illustrator Award, and John Step to Award for new talent for author and illustrator as well. And I just noticed uh, Ruby, our youth services manager, just popped in. Um, I know that she was eager to talk to you for a minute. I think she had some questions. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. I loved your talk. It was very intriguing. Um, <laughs> we, I work really hard. I do the collection development for our library. So I work really hard to make sure that we have diverse books. Um, and just in the five years that I've been with the library, um, the change in diversity in books is just leaps and bounds just in the past five years. What do you think the next step is or where do you think it's going to go from here? Hmm. I think the next step is just to get more black authors published because if you notice through those lists, we kept seeing the same names, <laughs> kept seeing the same names being celebrated, and that's fine. But um, there's so much new, new talent out there, and to Jason get Reynolds is wonderful, but he's right. won everything at this point. Right. We uh, we joke and call him Mr. CSK. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but um, you know, there's other talent out there. We've got to find them, and I don't think it's not about us finding them either. It's just the gatekeepers, like what they think is going to sell. And it's kind of frustrating because you have all these examples of what sells and what surprised them, but it's still like, um, I've had black, black authors will say, and they'll tweet about it even, like I went to my age today and they told me that this wasn't black enough. You're just, this isn't authentic. I don't think this character would have responded this way. I don't think there's a market for this story and you're telling someone this when you're not even a part of that experience, you're not a part of that community. And so I think it's still frustrating about the gatekeepers, like, what can we do to get the publishers to take on more people and to take on stories that they don't think? Because I look at, I'm really thinking about fantasy and science fiction. And, <laughs> you know, usually it's always a token Black person, but I was so excited about Legendborn because Brie was the focus character and it wasn't just she's in this and she's Black, but we're not going to deal with it. They still had, she still was dealing with microaggressions, even little things about what to do with her hair because it got wet. That's a very black girl type of thing. Yeah. You know? So these little things in there, it mattered. And so just to see that story, to be able to read it and to award it. So I'm just, I think just identifying talent and somehow what can we do about these gatekeepers? We probably need to be focusing on more people of color in publishing. That, that was you know? what I was gonna ask. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of experience with the publishers, but I'm assuming it's, probably not diverse. <laughs> right. Um, so do you think that should be a focus is trying to get some more diversity in the actual pub publishing Absolutely. houses? Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, thank you for this talk. It's been wonderful. I, I love talking yeah. about children's books and diversity. And you're right. I've loved the uptick that I've seen recently in um, science fiction and fantasy featuring people of color and kids of color. And it, that's great. You couldn't find that seven years ago. Exactly. So exactly. I, I love being able to hand that to someone. All right. So we did have one other question that came in. Um, 
I love the narrative theory aspect. This was referring back to your previous question or previous answer. Um, did you use that idea in your classroom when you taught English? Um, I I used some other biblio, bibliotherapy um, methods in my classroom when I taught English. Um, the narrative theory came from my dissertation study. So I was using the Coretta Scott King titles as a diversity training tool with white university professionals. And so that's where that came, that came from, trying to figure out what can I use uh, with white people that would hopefully invoke some kind of change in their thinking about black people. And so rather than using nonfiction texts or even adult fiction, because a lot of times when you read adult fiction, I know I do it, <laughs> it's kind of like, well, they're nothing like me. And this wall goes up and it's very hard for narrative theory to occur um, from this, the research that I did when it's adult fiction or adult nonfiction, because you think you're reading about something or you can't connect to the character. But when it's a child, we have this nostalgia and we think about when I was growing up and what I was going through. And so narrative theory would be more apt to occur. And so I, that was why I used children's literature. And, that, and that's, that's where that came from, my dissertation study, where I was, we did a lot of focus on what texts are best to use to try to get that person to have a change in thinking and children's literature seems to be it. Yeah. That's a really good point. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, so we, this wasn't really a question, but um, one of our board members just posted um, both of a person of color and as a library board trustee, I am so proud of this presentation as well as all of the diversity and inclusion initiatives our library staff works on. Good job and thank you. So she's watching and enjoyed this too. Nice. Um, okay, well, thank you so much, Lakeisha. If nobody else has any questions, um, I did wanna mention that um, Lakeisha will be returning to Chillicothe virtually again in March. Um, OU Chillicothe, um, is talking to her about coming in for a Women's History Month presentation. Um, so we don't have details on that yet, but I did wanna just give that little teaser and keep an eye on um, OU Chillicothe's event calendar for that. And this presentation was also in partnership with OUC. So thanks everyone, have a great day. Bye, thank you.